My goodness. <laughs> he is so hey, Daniel. <laughs> How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, David. It's an honor and a joy to see you. How have you it's, been? It's an honor to see you, uh, to be here. Uh, it's good. Actually, one of the reasons why I miss some of these meetings is that I really want to be on time. And when it's like, oh, gosh, I'm five minutes or 10 minutes late, then I just uh, say, okay, maybe next time. <laughs> well, David, you come yeah. anytime. And Sam, my goodness, Miss Willem, it is Hi, good Sam. to see you. David, Sam is awesome. And in fact, David, people come in at 2, 2.31, so never, ever worry about that. You come whenever you like. It's really a delight uh, to see you. And I'm going to have to pick up that beautiful room book that you're telling me is a new favorite of yours. That just sounds, that's just I'll a I'll send you my copy. Text. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to send you my copy. I need to, you know, as you see, I don't have a shortage of <laughs> books. I need to, you know, lighten my, uh, the, lighten my bookshelves. Well, you are a gentleman. You'll notice that I don't ever have bookshelves behind me because then it would be undeniable my hoarding tendencies. Uh, so, you know, I just go with the strange photograph of a picture frame thrown in the That's air, good. picture, picture, picture sort of thing. <laughs> So that works up very well. But that text just sounds absolutely beautiful. And Sam, how have you been? Hi. Hi, Daniel. Uh, good. Um, I don't have French class today, so I thought I'd stop in. <laughs> well, delightful. Yeah. Well, nice to meet you, David. D David is nice wonderful, you, Sam. See, he does. Uh, we, we've had a few reading group series. He does wonderful reviews of books, and he always brings out the best in the text. And he's recently found those essays, like um, the one on the gentleman who was talking about why do philosophy, what, what is philosophy, I thought was really magnificent. And I really enjoyed that. Um, I'll ask you both what you've been thinking about recently, um, I'll, and whoever wants to speak. The first thing I was going to say, I've been, um, I've been there's a, a, a scholar named Antonio Wolf. And he was talking about how um, concepts are things that follow a development. He's a Hegelian. So, you know, we always have a Hegel quote in these net conversations. But the thing that was very interesting is how a concept in order to really follow the thing has to follow the development of it. And it made me think about how maybe words aren't so much definitions as they are concepts and that we speak concepts more than definitions. Like when I speak about a cat, it sounds like I'm talking about a four-legged feline that I'm trying to get you to have the image of that definition. But what's interesting is really, it's almost like it's more so trying to follow the development of the particular cat. And so like, it's more so that we speak concepts than we speak definitions. And of course, there's always a failure in that, right? And there's the beautiful Javier Rivera. Good to see you, sir. Um, so there's always a certain failure that's part of it. And uh, I think Javier came on and crashed my internet. Nope, everyone there, can you hear me when the camera, Javier, you came on and froze the internet. So what an introduction, sir. Um, so I was cutting out. So I'll be, Javier, good to see you. I was just talking about how I'm starting to think following something that Antonio Wolf was talking about, that words are not so much definitions as they are concepts, that we speak concepts, that when you think about the concepts, you think of them as definitions. You know, I say, what is a cat? And your mind has to kind of um, freeze the word into an image. But really, I'm always actually trying to describe a full concept that I'm always stuck in definitions, right? It's almost like every time we speak, we're trying to say a novel, but all we can ever do is sentences and words. And it's interesting because then what that would mean is often we talk about the failure of words, how we couldn't fully capture something, but that would actually be a feature. Like concepts are always having to follow, like the failure to ever get in on a slice or a particular moment is exactly what you would expect, because it's actually trying to follow a development of the cat being the cat from being a kitten to being older. I always use cat examples. It's something I can't help. And it's almost like the novelist, for one, is almost aware that that's what language is doing. Therefore, you know, Walker Percy had that idea that um, a, a, a novel is a metaphor that could be said no other way. You know, you had to have the whole novel or you couldn't get the idea. And it's interesting to think that actually all words are participating in that, even if it's not so clear. And so then when we talk, it's not so much that we're passing definitions as it is we're moving a concept between us that is developing as it's between us and getting more alive and more alive as it's going and formulating into something. And then that makes me think of like, 
you know, we, you know, I know Sam, you do so much in architecture. There's something about where an architecture is not trying to just make a building. Like a word is not just a definition, but create a whole experience, right? And it's almost like Javier. I know you recently did another video in the dating series. You got back to your roots there, right? Like we need to think about relationships not as capturing the relationship, but making something alive. So I was thinking about how words. It's almost like since we think of words as definitions and not unfolding concepts, that almost structures us to think about all areas as incorrectly, almost, right? Because if the most fundamental form of communication is exchanging definitions, some sort of stable state, something that we can capture in a sentence, then we're like, well, that's what architecture does. Oh, that's what dating does. Oh, that's what money does. That's what everything does. Because that's how we think about language. And language is arguably the beginning, like the most constant source of habituation out there. We're constantly habituating our thinking according to our language. Arguably, that's a reason why reading novels and books is so important, so that your language doesn't structure your thinking in a manner that is too linear and not so alive. And I was just thinking about how considering language as a passing of a concept and keeping it alive is helpful to think about all different areas. So that's where my thoughts have been, but there's any topic and I'm interested for anything at all. So I'm so glad to see all of you here today. Hi. Yeah, I'll speak to that. Well, recently I was uh, listening to a podcast on astrology and, um, y you know, as often is the case with that uh, subject matter, the, the podcast was discussing like the interpretations of these different asterisms. Um, and I mean, this isn't really, I won't really speak to astrology, but the guy had said there isn't literally a hunter in the sky you know speaking of um uh, orion but um i it made me think like yeah there isn't literally a human being with a bow in the sky and we all kind of know that but like what what is literally a hunter is is literally a hunter uh, a human being with a bow or is it like does an, an an animal could be a hunter? You know, like, what are we even saying when we say the phrase, like, literally a hunter? I don't think there is literally a hunter, you know, it, it, especially with that, where it's, it's based on a verb, really, not on a noun. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that's, I think that's a good, like, example of what you're talking about, where especially for, for verbs, or things which are um, sort of rooted in a verb. Um, it's more that, it, you know, the, the word more speaks to emotion, which really isn't, you know, it's more, it's more akin to what you're saying, where it's a progression, a development of a concept. It's like an unfolding. It, in a way, like hunting is kind of an unfolding, almost like through creation from like bacteria and amoebas up to us and, you know, across you know cheetahs and like <laughs> all these sorts of things and and i think the same sort of applies i do like to think about animals a lot and i was recent i i um I, I one of my patreon subscriptions is to uh, an animal rescue and they were talking about this uh, dog that they rescued recently and how she had complications with her birth and why they need money, but the whole story was just talking about her and her complications with her birth, and like it could have been a human, you know, like it was it was such a relatable story, and it really made me think, yeah, like motherhood, it's cross species, so what is literally a mother, you know, like that's such a varied experience when you think of the more than human world, um, yeah. So I hope that maybe the conversation along that's a beautiful point because it's so funny how we're like well it's not literally a hunter as if we know what a hunter is and it's a stable state so there's a kind of sleight of hand that occurs there um but that point also is so lovely because you know the word literally kind of is supposed to mean literature like according to literature this is a hunter well, what is a hunter according to literature? You'd have to read a lot of literature. And actually what's funny is it's almost like indirectly that's saying, yeah, you do. Like, yeah, you have to have a lot of mental models that when you say that's, li when you say that's literally not a hunter, you fall back on an array of stories, not just a single definitional concept. But that's not what we mean anymore. If, if literally when people said like literally like that, isn't that funny how that's in the air so much? But if when I said literally, it meant we must fall back on our literature and think about all our stories, 
that might be closer and actually show the truth of thought, which has to be active and it's not so clear. But instead, we mean practically straightforward. And that can't be what it means. And yet that's what we think it means. So there's some very interesting, and I guess that's Derrida's deference, right? Where we're always deferring and there's no stable thing. But then of course, def difference for Derrida, if words are actually more so concepts, that's actually a feature of language, not a fa failure of language. And then I'll pass it on to Javier. It makes me think also, lastly, it's almost like what words are, you know how in the game hot potato, you're passing a potato and who has the potato? What if it's like words are almost like seeds? And you have to pass them between people to warm up the seeds so that they grow. Like I'm using the term concept unfolding because I'm, you know, a Hegel knees, right? But you don't have to use that term. It's almost like it's like you. every word is a seed that you have to pass around. And the passing is what cultivates the growth. And you see, when if you ever stop and say, OK, the seed is done. Well, it's just a seed then. It's not a flower. The movement gives it the life. Uh, so now I'm thinking about hot seat or something. But Javier Rivera, how are you doing today, sir? Pretty good, pretty good. Um, yeah, there's so much on this. I think a lot of my exploration on the phenomenology of dating, uh, I think this is the first time like I'm, I'm genuinely exploring something that I don't know like where I'm going. Like in the middle of the conversation, in the middle of writing it, I have no idea where it's going. And what I've been discovering is it seems like when we talk about the concept, it's intimately linked with the body. The body is the structure of the concept. Hunting, I feel touched, I feel seen. Um, when a woman leaves a man, I feel stood up. This, the, the body understands the structure of the concept, but we don't actually understand the structure of the concept. This is what's crazy. And, and this is what, what I've been understanding through my writing of the phenomenology of dating is that I think Lacan was correct that the I is relatively narcissistically self-interested. But lately I've been writing about what I call like the symbolic finger because what's funny about the finger is, or the hand is that it, the I most of the time when it's captivated by an object of desire, it doesn't pay attention to the hand. When you bring something closer to you, you are looking at the object of desire, not really the hand. And so what I really found interesting was that the hand seems to be the background, um, kind of like the unconscious functioning around, grabbing, holding on. And it's funny because even when we get nervous, the first things we don't know what to do with is with our hands. Hands seems to be a sign of impotence. This is what I'm, at least subjectively speaking, a sign of imp impotence because technically hands are for us to grab, hold, move. And when we don't know what to do with our hands, we have to resort to something else. <laughs> and, 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 and one of my, I think I just published this one. I, I said, I said something like the virgin man, when he doesn't know what to do with his hands, he has to use the phallus. <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't, you know, he skips the foreplay. He's like, I, I, I don't know. I'm just going to use it. <laughs> I'm just going to use it. <laughs> right. Um, so I, I thought this was really interesting because the hand seems like it reveals bad epistemology, actually. Whereas the eye, wants to know so it must have have this certainty with the gaze and and the look and i i just find it interesting and fascinating that all the words that we use you know i feel touched i feel seen um the body seems to understand the structures more intimately than we actually understand them um the, you know even with the words insight um it seems like if it's not in sight, then I don't know, right? And the hands have a way of hiding itself. Um, and it's always out of sight until it brings up to vision. But typically when the hands get brought up into vision, it's, it's obscured. It's obscured by the object that you want to interact with, um, the woman that you want to touch or, or, or whatever the case. Even like my hands are just like, you know, throwing up, like I don't know what to do with them. Um, <laughs> right? Like, it's... Yeah, but anyways, that, that's my, my part of sharing on this topic.
So now you're going to have a phallus quota instead of a booger quota. So I'm going to hold you that every week and let me give it to Mr. Gavi. It's very interesting to think that when we're trying to signify that we've been most seen or most, well, right there. Like, it's like, I have to use a word that refers to a non-linguistical action. I've been seen. I've been touched, which has embedded in the structure of that sentence of failure. And it's interesting, like we have, it's like we're naturally we're attuned to the fact we have to use language that suggests a failure of language to suggest the greatest intimacy. But let me, let me give it to Mr. Gosley. Mr. Gosley, good to see you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love this, uh, this topic that you have uh, you've come upon. The hand and the understanding of concepts with the body as an embodied process. Uh, and when we don't know what is going on, that is re that can be reflected in our inability to do to do things with our hand or to not know. I, I don't know what to do with my hand. I think uh, when I'm thinking about past situations when I felt that way, uh, maybe I was in, most intensely. I remember high school uh, high school episodes where I would stand somewhere not no not knowing what to, what to do with my hand. I think that was an indication that I didn't know what kind. of, uh, situation I was in. I didn't have to resources when you said that the job, the hand's job uh, is when it is effective is to, to forget itself, to be forgotten, to get out of the way. And uh, when, when it fails to do that, uh, it, it's, it indicates a failure that is not just a manual failure. It, yeah, I uh, also, I think this, uh, Javier and I were going back and forth on Twitter about this uh, expression. I'm curious what Sam would think about, about this expression of, I feel seen. Or uh, I just realized, uh, I think it was Daniel who said, I, I feel touched. And these are, they, they convey or they imply certain ways of thinking about ourselves, certain ways of speaking about ourselves. What does it mean when I say I feel seen? Does it mean that I'm usually unseen? That I'm momentarily taking a break from my invisible life and the spotlight is on me now or I feel like I have a place now, but I'm, after this moment, I'll be back in invisibility <laughs> or, or I'll be back where I'm untouch untouchable, you know, after this moment of feeling touched. I don't know. I really like this idea of what do I do with my hands? And it's almost like what we do metaphysics. It's like, what do I do with my hands? Well, let me say something. It's almost like, uh, speak. And it is funny how, you know how there's that nervousness of I need to say something in the room? Like, oh, it's too quiet. Let me say something. It's funny to think of that impulse as somehow being connected to um, what do I do with my hands? What do I do with my hands? Um, if you always have a pen in your pocket, you can do this. It's quite useful. You can just spin it there uh, in different things. But then that, what if spinning the pen in your fingers is the equivalent of being uncomfortable with silence? You know, you're uncomfortable with silence so you speak and you're fiddling with your hands and that's just an uncomfortableness with being still. Now I'm wondering if there's a parallel with an uncomfortableness of being still in the same way that there's an uncomfortableness with silence. So I'm wondering if there's parallels there that are very interesting. I'll speak to that. Yeah, I think... Um... Okay, when I, when I think of the phrase, I've been seen, I typically understand it as like a moment of intimacy where somebody saw through me rather than saw me. I think often um, when I'm in a relationship situation and I feel seen from without, it's actually a negative thing. I, I understand it as like, oh, this guy, he just sees me for what I merely am rather than like through me. And I, it's like a turn off rather than a, than a feeling seen and a, and a, and a source of intimacy. Um, but then, you know, I actually don't find like if I'm to uh, break intimacy up into the Aristotelian senses, like I find like for me, the locus of attraction is really in the voice and in hearing. and. Um, I think like Slaughterdeck does a really good job in his one chapter in Bubbles of talking about how like our primary relationship is, well, he's got a whole thing about like having a, a prenatal relationship with the, um, with the placenta, but actually, but you know, if you think of your first primary relationship as your mother within the womb, you don't see her you you feel her you touch her you hear her you hear her like enormous like 
profoundly. You hear her heartbeat, you hear every digestion, you hear her laugh, you hear her sleeping. Like she is an omnipresent sound. Um, and I, yeah, we kind of forget that actually like our bodies are quite loud. We, our brain just knows to filter out that sound because it wouldn't be helpful if we needed to hunt or something. <laughs> um, uh, but we're very loud beings. And I think like when we talk about having an uncomfortability with silence, we think of that as a sort of negative thing or like a weakness or generally like there's negative connotations with that. But then I think like, you know, sitting still without moving, um, sitting silently, um, these are all like ascetic cultural practices that we do for the develop, like for enculturation into like, into, which is a sort of silencing of the word, which, you know, it, it's root is in orality, not, not literacy, right? Um, it took humans a really long time to uh, be able to read silently in, in their minds. Um, we used to read out loud. Uh, we, we, used, we needed to actually like breathe it to like try and more or less hallucinate the what is whatever the distant author was trying to mark on a page. Um, and now we expect children to like do that in their minds at like five, you know, that's, it's really, it, it takes an enormous amount of discipline um, of sitting still, of not moving. And, and I just don't think, like we see it as a bad thing, uncomfortability with silence, but maybe it's not really necessarily bad, but maybe it's more, natural to just general lived experience of being human beings of being animals beings you know like animal bodies however you split that apple you know anyway so that was a beautiful point and absolutely there can be a temptation to say oh it's good to be okay with silence when you know you're supposed to say something but you say that so then you're moral not to speak up when you're supposed to speak up right in the same way that you can use the whole oh it's important to speak when you know you shouldn't speak up but you want to speak up because you want to have control of the situation and it's always interesting how every one of these has to be balanced situationally with what's going on um and i really really like this point that in the womb there's all these sounds uh, in your first experience of your mother is not sight, but sound, really, or more touch or different things. That's pretty wild. That's a really good point. And now it's like you go, then you're born and you spend your whole life trying to see where the place is where you can live just by sound, right? If I want to take a 40 year old spin to it. So, you know, like you're trying to find the place where you can have the intimacy that isn't reliant on sight. And yet when the moment you're in the world, what you naturally find, unless you're born blind, you're naturally find yourself um, surviving more so by sight than the senses of which perhaps um, brought with them such a deep intimacy that you had in the womb. That's a very, that's a very profound thought. I appreciate that, Sam. Let me give it to Javier. Javier, please. I got like three minutes, so I'm trying to clutch this in, but no, I- No, skip your class. You don't learn <laughs> gonna, in class. I, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, clutch this in with what Sam said about the voice um, because immediately I start thinking about maybe maybe it's possible that we're uncomfortable because there seems to be a connection with the hand and the voice. I am thinking, for example, when a woman is pregnant and what does she typically do? She rubs her belly and says something, right? So it's intimately, it's funny because it's like the hand actually goes absent and the voice goes present. And what's interesting about music is that the hand is the one that is strumming, playing the acoustic, giving the acoustic presence, but it's relatively absent, uh, relatively absent. So I, I do find this really interesting, the tie between what I would call the symbolic finger and, and the voice, where it's like a voice can make you feel touched, right? <laughs> it can make you feel comforted, held. Um, when we get good advice by um, by our friends and, and, and other people, there's something about the voice that resembles the primordial interaction with the mother when she's holding you and speaking to you. Um, and, and, and so I, I genuinely enjoy that. I, I feel like there's something there. I feel like there's something there in that kind of 
holding and, and um, embodiment of understanding of, of how that voice is connected very much to um, the presence of the, the holding of, of the, the hands uh, in our, and, but now we can, you know, genuinely feel um, okay. But I think when we start fidgeting around, it's like, we don't have the, the comfort of the voice, which typically was associated with a kind of holding, a kind of stability um, in, in our presence. Yeah, and I'll also just note on Sam's point, um, because Javier is gradually deciding right now to skip class, is that it's actually like the whole point of, oh, it's good to be still. Well, that almost in a Foucaultian sense normalizes the school system that makes 10 year olds sit still for six hours a day, right? Not that I'm, you know, so, and maybe that's a good thing, right? I mean, but maybe it's not. But the assumption of certain things as being a good also can promote perhaps late, dare I say, laziness in thinking. Because instead of saying, well, how can we do education differently? Or maybe there's different ways to do it. You say, no, it's just moral to sit still for a long time. And so therefore you don't have to think of those things. And also I think it's really interesting what you're getting and I'll give it to Sam on the, it's almost like when you're trying to be most intimate, all the senses combine in this weird way. Like senses are a part. And then when you're getting intimate, yep, there you go, I knew it. Uh, so everything is skipped, like senses are a part. And then when you get most intimate, they're together. That's kind of it. It's like everything that rises converges or something, right? Like a, a Tra or Chardain or Flannery O'Connor. And that's interesting how like when language is trying to be most intimate, it refers to something it cannot be as if it knows it has to fail because the intimacy can't be captured in the language without failing it. So there's like a flag in the language suggesting that it's like indirectly aware of that almost or we something. So that's very interesting. Sam, please. Yeah, I wanted to bring uh, Bart's concept of the Gino song and the Fino song into the conversation. That was kind of useful, especially with what you were saying, Javier, um, it, because there is like a grain of the voice, I think is what, how he calls it. And um, like there are, you know, like, and kind of like I said earlier, where there weren't, you know, like older written languages don't have vowels, you just breathe through it. That was seen as like, the, the consonants were seen as um, as the sort of like articulations of language that gave it um, semantic content, but underneath that there's a voluptuousness, which is just like it's the corporeality that you give to your your specific voice, you know, and it's it is like a fingerprint in some ways, um, uh, but it but it but but it, what you were saying is there seems to be a com the, some sort of link between the word and the hand. Um, and I, I really just, I get that sense, like there is a, a weird, like you, you're almost haptically stimulated by sounds sometimes, whether it is listening to music or, um, or like listening to someone talk, you know, but I, I find this in architecture too, where like often like, I enjoy spaces that have visually haptic, like which are, have visual haptic stimulation. Like I can see their textures and I feel them even though I'm only looking at them. Oh no, Daniel's gone. <laughs> no, no, am I gone? Oh no, oh no. Worst internet we've ever had at the net, I'm sorry. But you see, this is actually metaphorically matches the effort of language to reach the thing and not able to do it. The internet connection cannot handle the topic, which actually creates more intimacy because we have to fight through the internet connection to be together. So then if we're together, it's more meaningful. So it's actually wonderful that the internet connection is poetically symbolizing the situation. So I'm very grateful for that. Let me give it to Mr. Gosley. I really like this idea of enjoying the seeing of texture, almost like seeing texture adds to the feeling and enjoyment of the texture and vice versa. It's like in poetry where you like, like it's not enough simply to have the sentence be beautiful idea. There's also the sound of the sentence, the structure of the words, like they have a different taste in the mouth. Serlene, Azura, Blue, they don't have the same taste, right? And it's interesting to think how being able to see texture or taste words actually makes them better, even if they're in, they're in they tend to be associated with a different sense. But let me give it to Mr. Gosley. Yeah. So I want to go back to that uh, idea of being uncomfortable with silence. The, I think the discomfort is not with silence itself. It is with unstructured time. It is the discomfort we have with, with the lack of structure. And I learned that from Eric Byrne, the guy who wrote Games People Play. 
and their transactional analysis. And uh, I'm, when I'm reflecting on the voices that I enjoy listening to, like really get deep enjoyment of a person who is talking, what one of the things that they enable is that they bring back a sense of comfort with silence within their speech. So when they say something and then they stop, they don't say anything, in that pause, you're comfortable. It's like they have structured that pause for you to just stay and linger and be comfortable with. And it's kind of like a design of a space where here is now a place to, to stay and linger and not do anything if you want. Um, so that texture, the rhythm, and I think good speakers usually have a rhythm. They get into a rhythm and that the rhythm of their speech is part of what, what we enjoy about them because they structure our time for us. Um, and I don't know about the intimacy. It's a really interesting uh, in possibility that maybe intimacy has something to do with breaking that rhythm and structure. Um, because we, we have faith in someone else and we, in our relationship with someone else to, to let go of the existing structure and rhythm to maybe find something else together. Ooh, I really like the point on structured silence versus not, because you know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about Javier timing philosophy. He knew it. He saw it before I even said it. I could see the look in his eyes because it's like timing silence is the key, not silence. It's timed well. It's the, it's the, it's the proper dance step. Also, what you said made me think, you know, Cadell once said that, in, you know, OSHA was big on having you hear silence, internet, dying, hum back and so you have the spaces between words and you can hear the silence um i always found that really interesting on the idea of like hearing silence in the way that osha struck because you probably heard a lot of silence right there because that was not structured silence that was unstructured silence so that was awkward because the connection went out so that would be an example of bad silence because it didn't feel planned but now if I intend it, which actually you're not sure if that was intention or the internet because it's all blurred now. So the ambiguity is not good either. You can't have ambiguous silence or misspeaking because you can't say English. You need actually that structure there, which then feels like it's proper timing. And I always like how Cadell was like with OSHA. He wants you to hear silence and how it's intentional. I think it's a beautiful point. And it does make me think about timing. And then here's the question. It's almost like what you were saying, but what if breaking the structure is an in invitation for intimacy? Well, that too might be timing because if you do silence before the relationship is ready to break the structure, then you have a problem. So you need structure to get to the relationship to the place where then you can handle the unstructure. And if you never handle the unstructure, then the relationship is rigid. But then if it's too unstructured from the beginning, it's chaos. And you want to get it to, I guess, that Nassim to leave anti-fragile concept that everyone likes to reference because it's pretty useful. It's pretty nice. Uh, so it's interesting to think of actually how speech, because that seems to be the skit. Like you almost have to have intimacy with someone in conversation to be able to do untimed, like unstructured breaks and then not be awkward. So it's interesting how all of this, the, the way that speech works may have some sort of mirroring on what's optimal for a um, dating relationship. And then Mr. Javier Rivera right now can bring together dating and timing. Uh, and thank you so much for skipping your class. If you're a professor or whoever is angry, just give them my email and I'll have Haven get back to them. It's no problem at all. Javier. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Daniel. Um, you know, I this whole thing on, on speaking and on structure and timing, I'm actually very interested in this specific experience where we are stumbling to say something and somebody goes, no, 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 I get you. I understand what you're saying <laughs> right now. What's kind of funny about this, right? Is that, no, 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 I, I get you. <laughs> <Okay>. yeah, so... <laughs> I'm laughing about this because most of the time that was like a, they don't understand. <laughs> most of the time they don't understand at all. But there is there is moments where that is not the case. That there there is moments where you are genuinely stumbling, and the person has a way of looking at you, and they gently, you know, basically say that they understand what you're saying. Um, this is very rare, but it. I think it's very close to what Sam is talking about when, when she talks about, like, I feel seen. Like, the, the transparency broke past 
the the structure that you're trying to frame. It, it broke past it, and and now you you the the person literally sees what the person was trying to to build in in a structure of of words and and saying. But I'm I'm very fascinated by that concept and about how that happens and why does that happen? Um, because I mean it's true most of the time when someone says no 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 I I get what you're saying <laughs> no 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 you do not get what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that's why I, I I've learned over the time to like never almost never say that uh, uh, at all <laughs> you know <laughs> but yeah I'll pass it on but if you do say it and it works it is such a wonderful gift for the other person if you can actually pull it off and if it is based on a real understanding so uh, maybe you could take the risk occasionally but isn't it? Because, that's that's exactly right. It's like there's a risk to it, though. It's like, are you going to stick the landing? Are you ready to stick the landing? Are you ready to go? Right. Usually, sometimes when you think if you're going to stick the landing, that's precisely when you won't stick it because you're overconfident, right? But I agree with that point that it's like most intimate at that at that if you can pull it off. But I also agree that a lot of times people go, yeah, yeah, I I, I understand you. I get what you're saying. Uh, or different things. So I was actually ready when you said feel seen for the internet connection to drop. Because met like formally, that would have been perfect if everyone would have vanished, right? When you said feel seen, which then would have been perfect because we would have actually still seen each other in our hearts because we wanted to be connected as the internet connection denied that. So that would all speak to the failure of the internet connection is also a failure of language to actually also, what's interesting, create desire, right? Because when the internet connection goes out, you want to get back on, you want to get connected, you want to continue the conversation. Likewise, with words, you're always fumbling to find the words that um, that kind of go together. So it's really great that Zoom has been um, able to provide a structure that matches the content. That's really wonderful. I'm really glad about that. Maybe it's like Zoom telling us, shh, I know, I know where you're going. And I think uh, going back to this, yeah, going back to uh, what Sam's, way of describing being seen uh, you said it's not about being seen physically it's about uh, see seeing through being seen through uh, and in the case of a conversation what you're saying is that i know where you're going with this i know where you're headed i know where this conversation is headed and we can actually fold it now we can have that because we both know and fold it into this conversation and into the present moment and go somewhere else so that's the impact, what seeing someone, what being seen, mutual understanding allows. It allows for the creation of um, layers in a conversation. Go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> well, that, well, that's really interesting. Um, that was really freaking funny. <laughs> so really, um, so, but um, it, that's really interesting because there's a way in which you say, I know, I know what you're feeling or I know what you're saying. Which one is a way of we can get to more intimate and deep places because we don't have to go through this, but it then also feels like you don't want to go on a journey with me. So it's interesting how it's like, oh, I want to actually advance our relationship. So I'm telling you, I know this, but the other person's like, no, this is precisely what kills the relationship. And now it's like that seed again, where it's like, oh, I know the flower is ready to grow. It's like, so you take a hammer and you open the seed and the flower doesn't come out for some reason. Uh, so there's like knowing, but then there's the knowing where it's like, no, I believe if we keep moving the seed around the hot seed and the hot potato metaphor from earlier, it's now going to grow. And it's interesting to think of, I know as feeling like you're cutting off versus I know, meaning we can keep moving, like we can jump ahead and how it's the same feeling or the same language. I know, or I know what you're feeling, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's like how a story, and again, it's interesting to think of language, like all language is actually participating in story, even if it doesn't think so. Where a story, if you know the ending of a story, it can ruin it, like spoiler alert, you know, spoiler alert, now the whole thing's ruined. And, but there's also something where if you have a great journey, I know a lot of people say the journey is more important than the end. I think the journey and the end are just as important when it comes to story structure. Uh, I'm not saying you can't enjoy it at all, but it's very difficult to think fondly back on a movie or a story that has a bad ending, right? You may go like, oh, I remember enjoying it, but it's hard to have it. Well, you need both. So you need the process and the end. So the knowing when you say, I know what you're getting at, I know what you're feeling, it can't disturb the processing of the relationship with the end that that processing is going towards. So the word no has to hold both of those together. I know this seed is going to grow 
if we if we do the right conditions can never become i know the seed is going to grow therefore i'm going to hit it with a hammer and have it grow because now it's dead so let me give it to javier you know some of the <laughs> I, I like i really like where this conversation is going um the speaking on the failure of of you know taking the risk to say something and be like i know um i think the majority of time why it fails is because you don't have to say something verbally. Something my mother used to do, and I, I always used to laugh because my brother used to get very viscerally upset with her. And my mom would say nothing. And then she would just hug him, like squeeze him, like hug him. And he'd be like, no, I want to be a mad. I want to be so mad. <laughs> you know, but, I, but there's something about that movement where it can be that silence actually is just an indicator for a new equilibrium. Uh, it's, a, it's a new crossing for another equilibrium to go to, right? Like you don't have to speak, but you can still say something without verbally saying something, you know? And I, and I think the most pronounced example of this is, is death when somebody dies. How do you comfort your friend? Every time uh, people struggle with this, what do I say? What do I do? Um, most of the time, I mean, really, it's just mere presence, mere presence, a hand on the shoulder, um, a hug. Like it's it's just the mere presence. It doesn't resolve the the mourning, but it's the presence that is um, that is there, and it allows the person to still express um, the the mourning and and the structure of what they're trying to express. Um, most of the time, I would say it's probably dangerous to be like, oh, yeah, I know what you're going through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so it, it depends who the person is. Sometimes they might not they might not react well to that. They like they're not in that specific mode to be understanding about you preaching to them about their experience. Like they don't want to know that they, it's right now. It's in the mode of their experience. Um, so it's always a risk to to say something like that. You can if you know the person relatively well. Um, but I think most of the time it's handled with a kind of bodily silence, you know? Um, so I, I do feel like there is ways to say that I understand you without saying it verbally. And, and I think that that is a way to not interrupt the, the process of, of what is being uh, expressed. That's a really lovely example because there is, I'm now thinking about language around a funeral, like how people talk around a funeral and the structure of discourse. And I guess we could even bring in Lacan who is symbolic, imaginary, and real because we have a Lacan quota like everyone these days. Mr. Luba, good to see you. Um, and it's interesting to think like how indeed you feel like you need to say something, but then it's like, I shouldn't say something, but then you're like, but I'm afraid to say something. So I need to say something. But then it's like, well, maybe I shouldn't have actually. And it's interesting how the moral judge, the judgment of what the right thing to do in that situation almost suggests that whatever you pick, there's something lacking, right? And Mr. Luber, good to see you, my friend. And it's interesting because it's, it's almost like one wonders if it's not so much that you didn't say the right thing or you did something wrong as it is the very structure of language itself will not allow what is adequate. And so as a result, that's where that silence you're talking about feels most right. But then, of course, for some people, if you're silent at the funeral, you're not you're afraid, right? You're not speaking to them. You're avoiding them, right? Well, how do you determine what's what? You have the relationship, your own motives. I think funerals are very interesting precisely because they almost bring out not because usually when we talk about death, we talk about death, like dying, but a funeral like to talk about funerals as social events and the particular dynamics that unfold at a funeral, how people talk, what people say, because that now there is almost a reality of the, a glimpse of the real in a Lacanian sense that cannot be plausibly denied through symbolic and imaginary registers, right? Registers, right? And how it's almost, one wonders if what people do at a funeral is almost a litmus test of the entire social order. Like the social dynamics of the entire order at large is almost brought out at a funeral. I like to say that's also the case with art. I've been doing a lot of uh, Hans Ruckmacher, Cardinal Newman's grammar of ascent and all these different things and uh, different things. So it, it's interesting to consider that. And, 
And yeah, there is something too where it's like you feel like just the, the, the presence is the right thing to do, right? And yet at the same time, it's interesting in that example, then I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak. Because in order to do the thing that you might be supposed to do, you have to face the fear and anxiety of not doing what you're supposed to do. Because they may interpret you as being scared to speak or not speaking when you when you do. So it's interesting because there's like a courage in there. But what if that courage is just rationalization to avoid speaking? Well, that there is part of the courage. And then we have like an infinite like self-reference that we have to deal with. And it's almost like you have to, it's almost like putting yourself in that situation is almost good for the structuring of the subject to just see what kind of person you are and what you would do in that situation and how would you think. And yet we tend to avoid, and I guess relationships are the same, right? Like relationships can also entail so many of those constant judgments that are so difficult, just like a funeral can. Uh, but let me pass to whoever wants to speak. Yeah, I really like the sight of the funeral because um, when you think uh, like pre-modern times, the, bur the dead are buried outside of the city wall. Um, the dead are outside of society and people who are outcasts are ritually dead. Um, so it's almost like actually when you're at a funeral, it, it, it's this, there's this funny thing that I think you, I see you as describing where like the, um, the sort of the um, super egoic, like uh, ritualized, like pleasantries with it that are work so well within society kind of break down when you're talking about death. So you have to risk going outside of society to be able to say the right thing and to acknowledge like that you are, you're, I don't know, you're speaking on the dead, you're speaking, you know, like you're speaking to the dead, you're speaking for the dead. Like it, it doesn't work with the kind of usual structure of, hey, how are you doing? Oh, good. How about you? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I wanted to take it back actually to this idea of like, I know um, what you're saying, which is a, another one of these like risk situations. Um, and Javier, you're talking about uh, presence. And I just feel like that presence, it's sort of to take it back to the kind of beginning of the conversation, it is really corporeally, uh, corporeally, corporeally felt. It's a feeling, it feels like a touch. Um, and uh, it's kind of funny because again, it's like the hand and the word, the voice and the word, they, they feel like they're they're cooperating really strongly. Um, and, I, and I get this sense too, when a really well-placed metaphor is uttered, you feel the, the intrinsic rightness of its mappings. Um, and you're like, mm, you taste it, you feel it. Like, again, it's very corporeal. Um, and I wanna, so I guess all that, I'm just throwing out things that I'm seeing in the conversation, but I kind of wanted to move the conversation just a little bit more towards what I usually think about, which is like space. Um, and it's this weird thing where, and uh, David, you had mentioned this as well. When you say, I know what you're talking about, it has, it's a risk, but when it works, there's this possibility of going into more intimacy deeper. It's almost like a Russian, like nesting dolls. Like you step into uh, the inner sanctum of the conversation more so, you know, like they've, they've transgressed a threshold of some kind. And it's like, I think that what I have just said is a fitting metaphor, um, but why is it a fitting metaphor? Like what is this exteriority, interiority, like seeing me, seeing into me versus seeing my exterior? Like, um, you know, coming into the conversation, like why does that work, you know? Like, and a part of it is I think that actually these concepts, our bodies kn knows these concepts better than our definitions do and that, a lot of the things we're actually talking about, we recognize through actions that we you know, did with our body, um, standing up to somebody, you know, like, and every morning, I mean, you, you, you have millions of instances of standing up to which to relate that, you know, that, that feeling. Um, yeah, and, and this kind of goes back to the, the death thing where it's like, if, we keep playing with these interior, exterior, inside, outside metaphors. And I mean, in, in, in Western culture, that was really like explicitly instantiated 
in again in pros in um traditions of like burying the dead outside of the city walls because it's a sort of outside of the social order you know like it all seems cooperative and in in, in weird ways once you start to stack them on top each other of each other so yeah whoever wants to that's a that's a beautiful point sam mr luber good to see you and now i'm wondering if you know in the same way that in heidegger death structures the, st the subject into a story i wonder if the funeral is what structures society in the way that death does in heidegger for the subject and if there's some sort of thing there um also what's very interesting is that everything we're saying about language i think the points that you're getting at like last week we were talking so much about how nature and notion are inner like cannot be separated in the same way like like michael levin with the xenobots are talking about how there's like a teleological structure in things that emerges wolfgang smith who i know mr luber has been doing oh by the way mr luber is doing an incredible book on writing stories it's so dead with alex and davoud that book's gonna freaking rock uh it's really really awesome davoud a hey, uh andrew davoud is awesome uh so really good stuff there um and really good stuff and anyway so michael levin talked about the, the vertical causation where what you're seeing here and verbeke is now talking about neoplatonism that seems to be a self-generating form of the entity themselves it's not that forms are over things but that they somehow are generating their own formulating principle from out of nature right well nature and notion are so deeply linked together it, you almost see this happening in language all the time like you're trying like like you were just saying like language it, you brought it to space well what's so interesting to me about language if I ask Javier, does he want to go to the movies? And he really doesn't want to go to the movies. And he now has to tell me no, but knows I might be upset or say yes and has to do something when he does. It doesn't feel like he's merely in a linguistical exchange. It feels like he's in a whole world now. Like it's a choice between going into one world versus the other. And I guess Heideggerian earth versus world or something, right? So it's interesting how language, and here's the key. Language, in my opinion, really, really unveils how it's almost like metaphysical space when you don't like the language you're hearing. Like when you like the language you're hearing, it's like Heidegger's working doorknob. It's invisible, right? You use it and you go through, it's not there. But when I ask Javier to go to the movie theater and he doesn't want to go, he feels the terrain. He feels the texture of the choice. He feels that it's not merely information, but it's much, much deeper. And it has something to do with space. I also really like the point where you're talking about how um, a metaphor fits. It's always weird. There's a scene in To Turn the World where the dad's going through the keys and each key on the key ring is referred to as a metaphor. And you're looking for the one that opens the door. And then Don's like, hey, that metaphor fits. Uh, you know, that as a metaphor fits. And it's interesting how, to me, it makes me think of how when you have a room and you're moving the furniture around and then you see it oh, that's good. That's where it should be. That's where it should be. And you just know it. If someone asks you, why should the lamp be there? Well, look, okay. And yet it does. And so likewise, there's something here where language is like moving furniture around until you find the room, quote unquote, the space, the metaphysical space that works, and then you get it. Like you apprehend it, right? Um, just like the example I always like to use is one of those pictures that have like a lot of small pictures and there's a big one in it and you don't see the big one. But then when you see the big one, you can't unsee it. It's like at the end of Speak Memory with Nabokov, where it's like this find the sailor in the picture thing that he talks about. And likewise, once you hear the metaphor, bam, there it is. That's it. That's what it is. Likewise, when you hear the right articulation, bam, there it is. You see it all at once as if you never didn't see it. That's the other crazy thing about it. Once it hits, it's like there were no other metaphors. It's like all the other attempts at metaphors were just words. They don't even feel like they were metaphors anymore. It's like, it's it, this is the one. And then it's just just perfect. And let me give it to Mr. Rivera and then I'll give it to Mr. Luber. Also, what you were saying about the, um, the funeral makes me think of the eternal husband in Russia where they put the bodies on the table for three days. That won't play in. That, that, that would have, there was no small talk there. Uh, that was, that was, that was not like, can you hand me the coffee, son? Um, uh, but Javier, please. All right. So I'm going to stick my neck out here for the, the chopping block. Um, <clears throat> this is this is what I instinctually felt when uh, you guys were all speaking on this um, topic of space. I feel like actually the the voice and the hand intimately knows space, like it actually knows space. And I'm going to say that the eye is linked with time itself. And I got this hint with uh, Daniel when he said, it's when you start moving around the furniture and then you look at it and you go, that's right. It's there. Like it, it has to do with a kind of timing, a kind of understanding of time. 
But it's funny because the eye is, you know, typically the way we discern space. But what's funny is that the eye, it's only the hand <laughs> and the, the voice that really gives real intimate understanding of space because you cannot see something that is hollow. You have to be able to tap it and hear it. How do you know if something is hollow? It involves the hand and the ears and, and, and the sound that it's making. So you cannot know if something is hollow. Um, and so in that sense, I feel like the body in, in, in this manner, um, specifically the hands and, and the voice, really intimately understands spaces. Um, whereas the eye seems to be more uh, linked with time. And I think, I think this was, you know, the kind of, I think this was the reversals happening, right? Like, I think this was the problematic thing where I was thinking, oh, yes, I see all these depth and, and spaces and stuff. But the I think the idea of, of feeling seen, feeling touched is obviously having to do with that kind of uh, motion of acoustic voice and, and, and touch. And how it's intimately linked with knowing that there is more than what is in the appearance more than what is in uh, the, the barrier. And, and so in that sense, I, I really, that's, that's my chopping <laughs> block. So if people disagree, I'm willing to hear. <laughs> Can, but all right. I just have a question. Please. Just a clarification question, um, Javier. Uh, nice to see you, by the way. Um, so can you just go over again real quick, the difference between like, so there's the eye and then there's the hand. Right, that's the distinction, and I'm just the, the hand is simply the the work, and then the eye is the basically the and it's like the class. Are you making like the the like? I guess can you just explain the eye a bit? What yeah, you're trying yeah. to say with the eye in relation to the hand a bit more? I'm I'm just not. It's yeah, yeah. Not click. Uh, I, I've heard these distinctions, but I feel like you're making something that's like a little different. I, I am. I am making a little something different. And it, it actually kind of has to do with my recent work on the phenomenology of dating, where I'm trying to say that I'm kind of using Lacan here, where it's like the eye is typically narcissistically self interested. And this is okay. why it's attracted to appearances. It cannot, um, it's sort of consumed with appearances. But if you think about the hand, when you, when you bring a, an object of desire closer to you, the object of desire, uh, it, it obfuscates the hand. It, it conceals the hand. You're not actually not a paying attention to the hand. You're paying attention to the object of desire because the eye is interested in the, the object. Um, so what's interesting about the hand is that when you don't know what to do, your hand starts fiddling. Like you, you, like the hand is like a, a great sign of like impotence. You don't, you don't know. You put it in your pockets. You start fiddling. You, you look at your phone. You know, you start tapping things, <laughs> scrolling. Like you, you just don't know what to do. And so it's, it's directly linked to how the eye is typically used as our source of epistemology when it isn't. And the hand shows how that fails, how the epistemology of the eye fails because it's fiddling. You don't know what to do with yourself. Um, and, and so I, hopefully that kind of clarifies a little bit what I'm talking about. I, so if the, I guess the, if the eye is appearances, then the hand is what? Like in what realm is the hand? Because I understand what you're saying, but now I'm like thinking to myself, okay, if I were to put a label on the realm of hand, what would that label be? So, yeah, that's... <laughs> so, so the, I'm typically, uh, so th this may take some, the context that I'm bringing in this from is from the context of dating, like the phenomenology of dating. So it may not apply to all realms. Like the Seinfeld episode, like the hand, like who has hand? Like, is that what you're talking about? <laughs> I mean, that, that, I think that, that, that correlates perfectly, I think. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, in terms of like, if we're trying to stretch this into like further realms, I mean, I'm trying to stretch it to see where it fails. Um, but yeah, that, that's just kind of the context of the realm that I'm working from. So, 
Yep. Well, a few things. First off, I really want to hear Steve Harvey in a daytime show talk about the phenomenology of dating and like advice. It's like that you're on the phone with your best friend. And you're like, I just don't, I just don't understand her. Well, have you tried phenomenology? Dang it. I knew I was forgetting her. So dang it. Um, you know, the, a few other things that came to mind. It's really interesting because now I'm thinking Lacan Lac, because you're talking about the I and it's funny, E-Y-E, letter I, so on and so forth. We don't associate when you hear something. It's funny that we, accept, we associate not having or lacking with sight more so, something we see. If we can feel it, it doesn't feel what, like we lack it, even if we may not feel the whole of it. If we smell it, it feels like it's close, right? You know, close enough to smell at least. And if you, it's funny you don't readily associate sound with far away. In fact, if you can hear it, you go, oh, it's close enough to hear, even if it's in the distance, right? So like when you hear like coyotes in the field or whatever, I don't go, oh, they're far away. My first thing is they're close enough for me to hear them, right? Likewise, it's close enough for me to smell them, right? But it's funny how, because I like a screen, I can't really hear the screen. I mean, I can't hear the screen, but it's like sight trains you for the ability of lack more so than other senses. Maybe, you know, that's kind of an interesting consideration that you're bringing forth. And yet... If we associate, because we tend to associate generally, normally, I'm not saying, you know, I did sign language for a long time, so I can tell you about that, but sight and, and braille and all that. So sight gets associated with the dominant sense for society, generally speaking, right? And yet that dominant sense is the one that seems to most readily train us in terms of lack, right? So maybe there's something of the association of sight as strongest that prone, that primes us to be more Lacanian. Right, not mono Lacan or anything, but more Lacanian. It would be a curious thing to explore. And therefore, if we want to avoid that, we have to phenomenologically train ourselves again. Ergo, join Javier's phenomenology of dating course. Starts every Friday. Their Valentine's special coming up. You ought to do it. Um, so you bring it there. And um, let me pass it on to um, let me pass it on to Andrew and Mr. Luber. The last thing. What's also interesting is that moment you see a room. And it feels like it's right. There's almost a sense in which you flicker out of being a subject into Dasein. Because you don't go, oh, the room is right because I say so. It's just, it's right. And you're part of the world. So you as a subject turn into a Dasein, which is part of the world. You know, because I'm using Heideggerian language because Mr. Luber showed up and, you know, it seemed like a good opportunity. And yet then you immediately remember you didn't have lunch and go back to being a subject. So you flicker into a, ah, the room's right. Now I'm hungry. I want a subject. You know, I want, I want food. And you're thinking about how you don't have food. And it's interesting to think of Dasein as something you can flick in and out of relative to like those perhaps explosion moments or those, those grasping moments. But please, Mr. Luber and then Sam. Um, so just some, just some thoughts that I've personally been having lately that I think kind of go into this. Um, when you count something, what you're actually counting is the commitment to a story. Like you're committing, like when you say like one atom, one whatever, you're like, like an atom is you, you committing to the story of biology. Um, so to me, it, it sounds like the, the notion of hand gets asked like the inherent what you are counting. And it kind of gets towards something beyond that, where it's like the 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 uh, inf I, I want to say like infinite possibilities of what is beyond what you think you are counting, and that and hand is like the access point to to that dimension where like appearances. It seems like the eye notion only kind of takes into account like what you're counting and doesn't think about the presuppositions of that which you are counting. So like, uh, I don't know if I said that right, but um, yeah, I think, I, I, I think, and like, it, it, it just goes to me, the, the focus that, like I've just been obsessed with this for like the past, like, I don't know, like week or so. But like the focus is just on information and because everyone's so much focused on information and they don't even know what else is out there in terms of like um different mental framings to take in the world and themselves so like just to uh elaborate where i'm coming from information 
pertains to all possible numbers, like in math, where I would like, I, I want to make a distinction where content is only taking into account finite numbers. And this is kind of inspired by, I, I think, Daniel, you said you, you and Alex, you were going back and forth on a net that was on a few weeks ago, where you're like, it'd be interesting if math to focus on finitude. And that to me, the problem is how we just naturally, how we phenomenologically, how we take in information. And if we just try to focus on something that's not information, that is, that is part of information. Like all content is information, but not all information is content. Like that, that's like, uh, I, I feel like a, a key point that I keep coming back to in my mind, uh, that basically, uh, if you think about content, you're thinking about the creative process where like, when you take in information, you're like, I have one finger up and now I don't have a finger up. So now that I don't have a finger up, it takes into account like the negative one. So that negative one appears because information pertains to what's already at hand, where content pertains to something that doesn't exist. And then it comes into existence. So it goes from zero to one versus one to negative one, which would be like information. So if like we were to hyper focus essentially on going from like zero to one instead of just focusing on there already being a one, which honestly might be a little like contradictory to like to like Heidegger's notion of Dasein in a sense. It's like you're almost starting from you're not with in like there's a part of you that's almost not in the world i want to say and then that part of you then there's a transfer of you then becoming into the world and that like transfer that that dimension of of, of translation or transferring would be content um so i just think that would be like another way to say that's hand that's hand you're focusing on content you're focusing on how to like bring in how how to presence how to bring presencing in the world if that uh makes sense and now i'm thinking if you can't count without a story can you can you arrange without a room you know in the same way that all facts require the worldview to be facts right so if you count there has to be a story or to have quantity there has to be quality as well can you arrange without a space or something right and then the arrangement of a room versus the arrangement of words in a sentence to create like a metaphysical space or something. And I think the point also you made is why words are so interesting because they seem to be in the world, but not in the world at the same time, which is always this weird thing, right? Um, Sam, please. Um, Javier, uh, I think you're on the money. So <laughs> I, I feel like you're on the money. I want to move back. And I think, Andrew, I feel like I can kind of bring in what you were saying about um, zero versus one. Um, okay, so Javier, you spoke about how you think that the hand and the voice intimately know space, but the eye intimately knows time, which I love because it's counterintuitive, and I love counterintuitive things. They feel good. <laughs> um, and you brought up the, the, uh, the example of tapping on something to tell whether it's hollow or whether it's not, or solid. Um, and yeah, you, you cannot discern that with, um, uh, with your eye. Uh, architecture, it's moved into a very visually dominant practice because we have so many technologies for visualization. Um, and so often things are proposed like um, aluminum paneling that looks like wood, but is not wood, um, but which has lower maintenance costs. Um, now, aluminum sounds vastly different than wood sounds, and it's not an improvement at all. <laughs> um, you know, like if you were to yell in an aluminum clad space, you would know in a non, um, I wanna say non-cognitive, but that's not really fair to the word cognitive, but you know what I mean? In a non-mental way, you would know that it's wood or aluminum. Um, through your voice, um, it, or if you hit it, you'd know. Um, if you touched it, you would know. And so you're kind of knowing the material, you're knowing the substance, not the form. And again, architecture has this sort of, it's moved in a 
non-phenomenological uh, direction in that we're often thinking with abstract space, which is space as empty, which is Cartesian predicated on infinity, extension of lines forever, which can be measured when really in like a lived phenomenology phenomenological experience like we don't know we never know abstract space we know full space we know space which is inherently full of matter whether that's air or that's wood or that's aluminum but it's not it doesn't not matter it matters a lot um aspect for our experience um so uh so i think yeah i think this idea that like the the hand and the voice really know um space it knows the fullness of space, which is counting starting at one, not counting starting at zero, you know? It's the fullness of space, not the emptiness or infinity of space. Um, uh, and then the fact that the eye knows time. This again, very, very counterintuitive, but I like it because, and immediately my mind went to, hopefully a reference we're all familiar with, um, On the Road, um, Kerouac. Uh, you know, he's in his like uh, drug induced uh, insane throes and they're driving across the country and he's saying to his sort of like uh, friend from New York, he's like, he's like, I don't know the names, but he's like, we know it, we know time in the moth swarm of heaven. And he's like in these um, insane bantering throes, but like there's this constant refrain that he returns to is that we know not just uh, lowercase t-i-m-e we know uppercase t-i-m-e and he, and it's there's something in that like you you hear that from Kerouac and you're like yeah they know time and um it's funny because like with the eye you can discern the beauty of dance which occurs in time in motion you know you could never really feel like you could never have a haptic sensation of a dancer of like what they you know that that beauty that they elicit um, because it requires time um, and you couldn't very you know you would change the experience if you had your hands on them right um, and it also made me think of this time that um, me and my partner we drove from Victoria to Montreal through the states like like Kerouac's um, protagonist and um, I remember there was like it, it gets it starts exciting you're like we're on the road and then it gets really boring and then it just gets meditative where the sort of i want to say like the line of the horizon it's just in this like lava lamp melting you know it's like hill corner and you're just staring forward and you're just moving and it's it brings this experience of motion that's very visual like a tv screen or like a flame um before you and you really know the, the landscape in this like in this visual way, um, but through time, through motion. So um, I'm not really sure, like, I felt like the idea that the hand and the voice know space, Andrew, I felt like that that could be wed to your idea of, of um, like, uh, when we're counting with a zero, we're not in the world, but as soon as we move from zero to one, we're moving into the world and into presence. But yeah, I don't know how to relate that to the idea that the eye knows time, but I like these. Yeah. That's really beautiful. And as we come up on the end here, if anyone has final thing, we can go a little bit longer, but please, I've, I've enjoyed this immensely. I really like that idea of the horizon moving. It makes me think of when Ebert will always go, if I keep saying from, uh, you know, airplane, 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 around the seventh time, I'm no longer an airplane. And it's the total saturation he talks about and it becomes something else. And so, like, for him, total relation, which when we were talking about where Mr. Luba was saying on infinity only being infinite, I guess you get into, like, topography and all these different things, where infinity is only the relation between finite digits or finite, and it can relate at any point. Whereas infinity beyond um, finitude leads to all sorts of problems in number theory, and you're trying to figure all these different things, but infinity makes a whole lot of sense once you bring it into um, just talking about finite infinities, which would be like Hegel's total relation, like a circle or something, a total relation versus a spurious infinity. The argument is that all infinities outside a finite number set end up spurious, whereas if you were to just do infinity within the finite, you would have total relations. And then that would also help 
um, that would that would actually help math bring into geometry. And there are arguments to be made that if you don't bring Cartesianism, you know, um, calculus into geometry, you get all these problems or different things. But I'm not enough of an expert in that field. Also, for him, the number zero is precisely the equilibrium that isn't is what numbers are toward. But if they reach the moment you reach zero, it immediately can't be zero because if you reach it, it's there. And so although so practically it's a zero, but technically it's instantly a one again. It's shot back into finite numbers, right? And that's why we're saying every equilibrium then opens up a new um, a, uh, a new series of uh, the, the freak theory before it gets new total relation. That's why he talks about the magnetic zero of his band. Now, he can explain it better than, my, than I did. But a lot of what you're saying, and what's very interesting, it's almost like all of these examples of the senses and language and seeing and words are where you're taking a sense and having it reach a point of total relation where it starts acting like something else. And that would speak to, to speak theory, right? Like where you see something that looks like it's textured and it looks so well like it's textured. It's so successfully saturated the entire visual field that now you actually almost feel it, right? Because the site almost becomes a texture because it's so successfully a site in a weird way, right? And so there might be a freak theory analysis, or you have two senses that are totally relating to one another in a manner that de destabilizes the other and thus opens them up by this like new relation. And it does make me think like a novel, when you successfully read a novel, you forget you're looking at words on a page. Like the moment you see the words on a page, that can be a failure because there's a grammatical mistake or it's like the doorknob that's visible again. Now, it depends because then in certain poetic forms, it's literally the, the the words on the page matter just as much. So formally, but generally speaking, in a story, you're supposed to so completely relate to the story that it's almost like you're not. It's always the weirdest moment to me when you stop seeing words on a page and you see a movie playing in your head. That's like one of the most pro like there is so much philosophy to be done on that right there. The ability to look on words on a page and see a movie in your head, that is an incredibly rich thing. And that seems to be where you totally relate to the novel to the point where you're no longer seeing the novel. You're now in your head. You're now in a different world. And it feels like you're breathing in the air. You see the people. You feel things. And there's something really profound about that. And I think that also happens in a successful conversation. You forget that you're conversing, right? You talk enough and you totally relate to everyone in the conversation and you just kind of vanish into it, right? Just like subject becomes docile per se. You're part of the world and it kind of vanishes, right? And it's almost like in that, and then I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak. It's almost like that kind of forgetfulness that leads to a destabilization that leads to a new quality seems to be a precondition for the possibility of something new coming forth. We talked at the beginning about passing around a seed, the hot seed, like the hot potato, right? And it seems like when you, and if words are not so much definitions, but in fact are concepts that are moving and following the unfolding to try to capture it, then it seems that the successful moving of that concept to bring about the unfolding requires this kind of forgetfulness, self-forgetfulness, sense forgetfulness, total relation. And that seems to be the condition in which the hot seed being passed around has the possibility of blooming. But of course, that's really weird and mysterious. And so it would make sense why many seeds do not bloom. Um, so it becomes very interesting like to train in that way. But let me give it to Michelle. Michelle, good to see you, dear. Hi, guys. I always forget the mute button. Good to see you all. I haven't been able to be here for the whole time, but it sounds like a really great discussion. Um, just a really quick thing. Uh, when I was hearing like no time, no time, um, it made me think about like no time. Yeah, I always think it's funny that the word no is also no, N-O. And it just speaks to your point, Daniel, right? Where like the total saturation is a timelessness. Now that can feel good or bad. You know, that's the that's the the risk there, right? And you kind of maybe have to ultimately make a choice or something like that. But it's different. Like there's there's actual phenomenological difference in the experience of, you know, it's almost like when you're just like uh, in your class waiting for like just the last few minutes, right? Get this those day, basically. You know, it's like there's kind of no time there. It's kind of strangely like this you're like I wish time would be more like time and like keep moving along because it doesn't seem to feel that way right now but then there's the other timeless which is like this you know you, we, I'm sure we've all felt it like there's that timelessness of like you know hours go by and you're like it feels like it's been two minutes like what you know um so I think that's interesting with like the no time and how this idea of not knowing time sometimes I think really to know time is to feel this no time in either sense of the word right 
so anyways, I just want to throw that in there. <laughs> Good to see you all. Now, that's a wonderful example, Michelle, because when you totally relate to time, time's gone. Like when you're like in the moment, like Kairos time, it vanishes, right? Like the, um, that is not like the, op it's like not timeless, but fullness of time then leads to a kind of vanishing of it. Full immersion in a book makes the book vanish. Full immersion in a relationship, you're suddenly not two separate people. Like the relation itself is real, right? In addition to the individuals. Or when you really see architecturally well-designed um, wall or whatever, then it's textured and you feel the texture, right? And it's interesting to think that at, at these points of deep immersion, full immersion, full relation, and then I'll give it to Mr. Luber, that the sense is transcendent somehow, but not a transcendent that's a leaving behind. It's a, here's my Hegel quote, sublation, where it brings the old with it into the new and totally relates it. And it's interesting to think then, perhaps all of these failures of the senses then are force functions to force us to pull the sense further till it gets to the place where the horizon is now moving, to get to the place where now we feel what we see and what we hear has something, uh, what we hear then becomes something we can almost taste, right? And it's, it's interesting too, the last point I'll make, I really like what you were saying, Sam, if you see a room that looks like wood, but you speak and it starts sounding like aluminum, it goes away. But if you were to imagine walking into a room and never speaking and maintaining silence, you may actually have the exact same experience as someone in a room who didn't speak. So here's the trick with that. The moment you speak and you hear it, now you know it's not a real room. So notion has changed nature. So it's the notion-nature relation now. If you went into the room and you didn't speak, you may have a notion that it's real wood, therefore the nature is real wood. But the moment you speak, the notion changes, so the nature changes. And here we have that Hegelian nature and nature always informing one another. Just like if you, if you have speech, but the speech doesn't work or the metaphor doesn't work, that hurts the story because the notion is wrong, therefore the nature is wrong. But if you have a nature that doesn't have notion, that's wrong. And you have this interplay going back and forth, back and forth almost as if nature and notion themselves are looking for a total relation, at which point they would reach a saturation and equilibrium that would change their character, ergo sublation. And then it becomes the art of how to carry one's life in a manner to lead notion and nature in a state of total relation to give rise to that possibility. Mr. Luber, please. That was really well said. Um, okay, I just had to digest that. Um, geez. Uh, Okay, what, what I was thinking when I raised my hand was basically, I, so the whole uh, idea of when you're so immersed in it, the time is just gone. Um, and that's why for Heidegger, he just doesn't see time as linear because with that time, you're just so in it that it becomes a static. And it's like, in a sense, if you want to think in a linear way, it's just everywhere all at once in a certain sense. Um, but what, and this, I guess maybe because of just my readings of Wolfgang, but like what he, what Heidegger is missing is that, so when you keep diving into the journey of immersion and it's like, okay, like I'm immersed and then, you know, new, new experience and the world changes and then you get immersed again. And like, you can like use your Hegel term sublation and you bring in the past immersions into the new immersion, so to speak. Well, in order for that process to happen, there has to be something that exceeds beyond the current immersion uh, setting that you're in. And that doesn't mean that there's something that's like transcendent, like from a whole nother dimension, but there might be something in the, the base or, but rather it could be just in the landscape itself. You're just not as immersed as possible. And that there's new possible uh, ways of going through the landscape, even though you've already gone through the landscape. And that is why like Wolfgang, like really focuses on these like different, realms based off of the corporeal realm and like that just simply to me it's just a reaction to like a heideggerian type of thinking where it's not establishing like some form of subjectum in the like immersion process not the immersion itself because heidegger is so caught up in the immersion itself 
and he's not really thinking about the immersion process so to speak like i think he's thinking about it in like the everyday fashion where it's like okay how are you immersed in the everyday and he gives examples but he doesn't really talk about from a life journey standpoint how the re-emerging keeps happening how you're thrown into the world and you continue to be thrown keeps happening he just points it out that it's happening and that's why i think like there's the whole concept of vertical causation is just pretty much focusing on the processing of immersion like the continual processing of immersion and like that's what i think his whole like wolfgang's whole critique of science is is that it's not taking into account the whole processing of immersion it's only taking into account one glimpse one occasion of immersion and not the continual occasioning of emerging of emergence these or whatever the uh i don't know the Word, but um, I just, it's just really uh, coming together for me at least that the Cartesian paradigm just created a hyper focus of just the immersion based off of just the subject object split and you just thinking about your subject in the current immersion that you're in because you've already split the immersion, so to speak, that you're in. Um, and that if we just focus and then to go back to what I was saying with information, we have like, that's all subsumed within the information paradigm. So if we just thought about more of the immersion processing, then that I think in tandem with the uh, standalone immersion point of view uh, can create like just a different scientific paradigm, a different um, way where perhaps the artists are more deeply involved than we would think. Like that's 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 what I I, I definitely think with the advent of AI that will be revealed. Like that dimension will be revealed because AI will force it. Go ahead, Javier. No, that's beautiful. Let me give it to Javier, and I'll just note there does seem to be a difference between the invisibility of science when you're fully immersed in it. Then the visibility when you realize, oh, science is just a subject among many, and then almost invisibility with the I and in parentheses where the science and the subject become invisible in the full act of it. And that third state seems to be the most difficult, right? And that seems to be, it's, it's basically, that's the state of total relation or total immersion. Not merely the, not, it will not work to have an immersion that re reifies the, um, the subject object divide, right? Um, so you have to have an immersion that move that that sublates the subject object divide. And that seems to be for Wolfgang or Mr. Ebert, like total relation is when a platonic form appears, right? The platonic form uh, manifests out of the relation. And now there's a new form that allows new formulation, because I think it's always helpful to think of platonic forms as formulations, not fo like forms, because those are like perfect things you fit into, where forms, in my opinion, are more like the orbits of planets that formulate. So at the point of total relation, that is pos that is the point of invisible with the I in parentheses. Thank you, Michelle. That is when a form emerges, ergo vertical causation, that allows new quality, right? And that seems to be the name of the game, and that seems to be very tricky, and that seems to be what one must achieve for the hot seed passing around to grow. Uh, but please, as we come out the last 10 or so minutes, if anyone has final things, please, I've enjoyed this immensely. It's been a joy. But Mr. Javier Rivera. Uh, Andrew said something on AI, and I think it really shares why there's such a panic over AI and its uh, semblance of human beings, or at least the possibility of semblance. Um, and completely stripping it away. Like I, I know recently there's been panic over how the, the, the voice can be sort of replicated through the AI, right? Um, there's something very interesting about that because it's like, it shows really how the eye is the dominant place of space epistemology, right? It, it, like, it looks like a human, it acts like a human, it scares me. I don't know my place in the world, right? But here's the thing, right? The acoustic and the touch, that's how you know what is human, <laughs> but, but you don't know that from the eye. You're not going to get a sense of that from the eye. And I feel like that's, that, that's the whole panic is that we don't know what to do with this representation of 
what we call human beings. <laughs> you know, because it's really not about the AI. It's really a panic over the representation of the human being. You know, the AI is relatively unknown as to what what it can do. I mean, we can speculate all day, like, yes, it's going to get there, it's going to get there. And and I agree. I, I agree that there is all these possibilities of getting there. But I think the, the initial panic and fear is that we haven't we haven't actually really had a full saturation of what a human being means. <laughs> you know, we haven't had that. We have had a, just a dominant visual epistemology of what a human being represents. And that is, to me, the most troubling uh, thing that we can face like right now uh, with, you know, chat GPT, everything. Like nobody just, nobody knows what to do. And it's, again, it's the panic of the hands. Um, they decided to make another AI. <laughs> you know, it's the panic of the hands. They decided to make another AI and another AI to, to compete with, um, uh, you know, chat GPT and, and everyone's panicking and artists don't know their place in the world um, because they, they feel like the AI can steal their art. And But it's like the artist, the artist, I, I think I understand the artist's gripe because the artist intimately knows the space of the work. You know, it intimately knows the space of the work, but you cannot uh, argue, uh, it's hard to argue that it is your work when the AI can replicate it, right? And I think that's the, the, that's the discrepancy. It's like, no, it's my work. It's, I've, I've poured myself into this. Um, and so it's that intimate knowing of space and, and, and being in the world that the AI will, will abstract away. It abstracts away. But I think that, comes up in the conversation of like, oh no, it's stealing my work, it's stealing my work. But it's like really stealing the intimacy, really, I, I would say. It's more about stealing the intimacy away, um, which is hard to actually express, but yeah. I now have this image of a meme where a guy's sitting at the computer and the computer's typing and he has his hand, he's like, what do I do with my hand? What do I do with my hand? Because the chat GPT is doing all the typing for you. Uh, so that's quite terrifying. Uh, and then maybe like a puppy and a putty, like trying to swim, like the puppy's trying to get to shore in the ocean is called chat GPT 72 uh, or something. Let me give it to Mr. Lou with the last thing I'll say. It's also very interesting because actually if AI was perfectly human, it wouldn't worry you. It'd just be a twin. You know, the problem is that it's 99% human, not 100% human, therefore isn't like a perfect trend because it was a, if it was perfectly human, it'd just be another human, right? So it wouldn't bother you. Uh, so it's funny how like we're worried about it replacing humans, but it's only going to do that if it's, not, if it's not totally human, right? You only replace something that you're not totally identical with, and yet it sounds like you're total, totally ironic, um, identical with it, which may suggest something about like why words are able to add something to things they don't have because they're like the thing, but not totally like the thing um and then the last thing i'll say um on that is um is is, is it, it's also suggesting where the relation is the you were saying we've never actually explored the full human being well the relation seems to be where it's at not the individual also i'm always fascinated by the phenomenology of reading a book can an ai look at black words on a piece of paper and have a movie play in its head right if not or it can only do something like that Whatever that is, because that's very mysterious. I don't think it's the same as text to video. That's what you say. It's just text to video. No, there's some ability to look at something and see something else at the same time overlaid with it. Um, that phenomenological experience might be worth investigating to try to get at what is the um, unique abilities of human beings that they have that AI may not be able to take away. I'm not sure. Or you could just be Amish. Whatever you like, Javier, you would look great as an Amish guy with a little hat on a horse and buggy. I think you do a great job. Uh, Mr. Luger, please. I think, and now I might be misunderstanding what you mean by intimacy here, but I think part of the problem is us, like humans, in the sense that we're not willing to, so what, what, what I have in mind is like Heidegger, like famously, well, he says, he says two things really, that is really relevant. One is like to what Javier is saying, um about we're, we don't have the relation we don't have the epistemology we just have the representation the appearance he would just say we've like yet to begin thinking human like we have yet to actually begin thinking and that's and that part of that is because of how we relate to the world around us where we don't know like what actually moves our every day like intimately and like what I mean by that is Heidegger makes a point where it's like during his time, 
he wrote Being in Time in like 27, I think. He's talking about how nobody knows how a radio works, but yeah, everyone uses a radio. Well, everybody is using learning machines right now, language models right now. But I guarantee you, if you go on the streets and you ask people, what is a language model? What, what, what makes a language model work? No one's going to know what that is. So in my mind, what actually is moving the world, fewer and fewer people are actually becoming, uh, not becoming, having an intimate relationship with that. And because they can't actually know what moves their world, how could we ever expect that proper relation to exist? And, and like, we kind of like screwed ourselves because we put so much into the relation that from a, from a position where we didn't have a proper relation to begin with. And, uh, it's like, if we were to have that proper relation, we would have to know all this technology, all this math, all the science. It's, it would be too much. It's impossible. So it's, it's just interesting how I think, in my opinion, because we've created the impossibility of that, pro of that proper relation, we've created something that's going to reorient us to give us the opportunity to have that proper relation again. And I just think, um, I don't know what that means exactly, but like my knee jerk thought is like, people just know what is making, what's making them their world move. You know, I go on the internet. Well, do you, do you know what the internet's about? Like, I think AI will somehow provide easy access for us to like, have like a foundational understanding of the things around us. And that hopefully could reorient ourselves. But yeah, that's that's my thought. Beautiful, Mr. Luber. Does anyone else have any final thoughts? It was nice to meet you, Andrew. And Michelle, great to see you. Uh, otherwise, I had a great time. I'm going to think more about the relationship between the eye and the hand. And I think that uh, the relationship, one aspect of the relationship is that the hand educates the eye over time. That's why the second time I look at that hollow object, I, my, just with my eye, I can recognize it as that hollow object that my hand did that thing to. So remembering uh, what I did before. That's why in, when I come to your house, I don't feel the same sensation with the objects that I have in, in my place because I've touched everything here, touched extensively. And I'll, I'll be touching a lot of the objects if I come with it. <laughs> Sounds creepy. All right, it was great. Uh, speaking with you looking forward to next time bye guys Davood, you are awesome now i have this image of Davood <laughs> coming into the house and feeling all the shelves he's like i want to know this place and different things um it's necessary <laughs> it's necessary um well does anyone else have any closing thoughts nothing that wouldn't spiral us down a whole other rabbit hole <laughs> beautiful sam next week excellent and you know i wanted to know um well thank you sam it was really great seeing you here today i wanted to know how the internet started to work beautifully once Michelle showed up and it screwed up when Javier was here. So thank you, Michelle. Um, also, the meaning of functioning Zoom was more meaningful by the end because Zoom was invisible. Then it was visible because it broke. But we came back to the place where it was invisible and we're able to also carry ourselves in a manner where we stopped thinking about Zoom as breaking. So that seems to be the structure that we have to go forth with uh, in regard to society as a whole. Thank you, Zoom, for the opportunity. A few things to close. Um, Raymond has that wonderful video where he talks about how the uh, Raymond K. Hasso, I love his channel, I love that guy. He talks about in the Blade Runner movie, you can have the virtual girlfriend and you get everything with the girlfriend, you just can't touch them because they're not real. And that's alluding to like an Aristotle where the way, the only sense that can tell you the difference between reality and illusion is touch, really. Now, whether we buy that or not, that's what as Aris, you know, Aristotle is trying to get at. You can't touch a mirage and so on and so forth. So it's very interesting, Davoud, on what you're saying where hand trains the eye because if hand is nature and eye is notion per se, Notion trains nature and nature trains notion and they go back and forth in a feedback loop. And it's interesting to think that we need both and that our full existence is the training in between those two, the uh, relation between those things. A few more things, Mr. Luber. It's interesting to think that right now, it feels like you have to learn everything, right? Like we have all these time-saving devices and we have less time than ever before. And what if ChatGPT and the internet gets so advanced 
that we no longer feel bad about not trying to know everything because we can't know everything. And I wonder if a negation will occur where we then don't worry about that anymore. And we actually start focusing on the things we can know, like the relation, like the mystery of the phenomenology of reading the book and people. So perhaps technology will reach a total relation point that will make it practically like a zero per se, that in doing so will bring about a new phase of humanity where we finally don't have our technology suck all our time away because we can't ever use it in the manner to get to as far as the AI is. So we stop trying. And instead we use the technology to do other things maybe be more human, maybe be fully human, but then it would be the question of what that is, maybe to get better at passing that hot seat around so that it will grow. The last thing I'll say is it's interesting, this whole time like where we've been suggesting there is something about the senses that seem like they are striving to reach a total relation with another sense to bring about a new quality. Um, where sight text, and it's like that total relation, something new, total relation, something new, and total relation is based on the freak theory, as you know, of Mr. Alexander Ebert, who I believe is speaking at the store right now regarding a and artificial into AI and artificial intelligence. I think it's extremely valuable theory. Um, and it makes a lot of sense and it brings out Hegel a lot, uh, which I'm biased toward. But it's interesting that senses seem to want to do that, to reach a point where a new quality comes out. And it would also seem like if words actually are not so much definitions as they are concepts that are moving to create a certain following a concept so that the words cease being words per se and become more like movements, then maybe what we see in words is a desire to reach a total relation with the other person you're speaking to so that you enter into a dance so that you enter into a movement. And in that dance, a new quality of emergence comes forth that shows something that human beings can do that they cannot necessarily do in their individuality, which the phenomenological experience of all senses seem to suggest is indeed what we were trying to do. And so in conversation, there seems to be further evidence of this effort of the human being to reach some sort of experience of a total relation that brings about a new quality. And in language, what's interesting is that the word if, if indeed in the most intimate moments, we start saying, I feel you, I feel seen, therefore we are using language to say something that cannot be put into language. Ergo, we use language that suggests the failure of language. It's almost as, as if there's a subconscious intuition that when you're trying to be most intimate of language, you have to create a kind of metaphysical funeral because we were saying at the funeral, a different quality of people come out. So we are speaking kind of funerals in a way so that the language fails so that you have a death and yet we are not dead. Therefore, death ends up being a function of emergence, really, a function of resurrection where a new quality of relation can come out precisely because language has been brought to the place where it has to acknowledge its own failure, which then perhaps suggests that humans are at their best precisely when they're willing to push themselves to a place where they themselves fail. And therefore, they are not becoming fragile. Therefore, they are growing. Therefore, they are submitting themselves to their own negation so that they can go forth in sublation. And it would be quite interesting if all senses almost have a natural structure to subconsciously realize that it's at the point of failure that we actually find a total relation that brings forth a new quality. And perhaps we could habituate ourselves as human beings to do the same thing for ourselves so that we as subjects might have new qualities and new ways of carrying ourselves that AI couldn't completely capture. No matter what AI is capable, capable to do with that chat GPT, I don't think it's going to be able to play hot seed as well as we can, and it certainly won't be able to grow whatever that seed might get for. But with that, I've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you very much, friends. It was lovely to have you today. Thank you, everyone.